Hi, welcome to Baking History. My name is Dara and I'm going to be with you through this class on the Civil Rights Movement in Jacksonville and St. Augustine, uh, and this is in Florida. Baking History is a class founded by Effie Winkler and taught by Effie and myself. What we do is we pick a history topic and try and find a fun and sort of historically relevant recipe to teach together. Uh, just as with every class, I'm going to review what the rules of baking history are. The first rule we have is bake it until you make it. Sometimes when we're making something for the first time, things don't always come out right. We might be rushing for time if we're in a classroom, classroom setting, or the weather isn't good for yeast, or it just isn't our day for cake. And they may not come out right the first time, they may not come out right the second time, they may not come out right the 20th time. The trick is just to keep trying because that's the only way you're going to get better and you just bake it until you make it. Our second rule is don't assume. If you're taking baking history in a group or if you are any other sort of classroom or group setting, don't assume things about the people around you. Uh, if you have something that you want to know, be polite about it, but ask, but don't ever assume anything because most assumptions are wrong. Uh, our third rule is if it's not for you, then it's for someone else. Sometimes when you come to baking history, we might be working with a recipe for a food or with an ingredient that you just don't like. And if it's not for you that day, then you just need to pick somebody else in your mind and it's for them. And you bake it with the same love that you would as making a present for somebody else. Uh, also, our fourth rule that I'm going to go over today is be kind. It's very easy to just focus on what's going on for you, but you should always take a moment to be kind. If you're baking in a group setting and you finish a step quickly, look around and see if there's somebody who might need some help. Be sure to ask first. And remember, no is an acceptable answer. It's okay for somebody to tell you no. At the end of each step, be considerate and wait for the group to continue and help to clean up at the end of class. So in this class, we're going to be learning about the parts of the civil rights movement that happened in Jacksonville and St. Augustine, Florida. Many times it's very easy to think that's something that happened somewhere else. But the dark truth is that many of these same protests and atrocities happened in the cities in which you live. And maybe you don't live in Jacksonville or St. Augustine or Northeast Florida, but this is still some great information to know. And then you can also take that information and look around in the city that you do live in and see what happened there, because I guarantee you something happened. And because this class's topic is a bit of a darker one, I like to pair it with the sweetness of a cake. So we're going to be making an integrated marble cake today. So before we get started, let's make sure we have all of our materials. On the class listing page, we posted the printable timeline cards, a timeline slideshow, the class guide, and a recipe. You don't need to print out the class guide or slideshow, and we'll be going through this as part of the class, but these are provided for teachers or parents who might want to teach this in themselves or adapt the class materials and teach it in a different way. Um, you'll need some version of the timeline cards. If you printed ours, um, I like to fold them over. I tape them shut with some painter's tape, and then I cover the dates on both sides because um, it's, it's super tempting to look at the answer ahead of time. Um, Painter's Tapes works really well because I can take it off without tearing up the page too much. Um, also, you're gonna want to uh, make sure you have space for this. If you decided to print them or write them onto index cards, I actually recommend that you have two sets, one that have the dates on them and another set that don't have the dates so that you can see them when you're when you're revealing the correct order. Um, you also need these materials and ingredients to bake the integrated marble cake. So you're going to need a mixing bowl, a spoon or a fork, I'm not gonna pick up everything, a cake tin that's about six inches round. Uh, this is mine here. I get them from the dollar store. They're very cheap. They come in, in multiple package sets. Um, a marker for names on tins if you're in a group setting. Um, it's very helpful to write it on the side or on the bottom. Make sure you write it big and clearly because sometimes they do wipe off in the oven, um, but that way you can keep track of whose cake is whom as they come out of the oven. Uh, cooking spray to spray your pan. I have already sprayed mine. A silicone spatula to scrape the cake pan if you want to. Um, you're going to want it to preheat your oven to 400 degrees. 
You're gonna want two tablespoons of warm butter. Uh, this does not need to be melted butter. It just needs to be so that when I touch it, it very easily is moved. So room temperature is good or a little bit warmer. Uh, a quarter cup of sugar, one egg, a teaspoon of vanilla extract, half a cup of flour, two tablespoons, or I'm sorry, two teaspoons of baking powder, two tablespoons of milk, plus a little bit extra, or sometimes a bit more extra, depending on how thick your cake batter gets, because we do want it to be a nice thin cake batter so that we can swirl our designs together. And then a tablespoon of cocoa powder. Um, so if you need to collect those items, feel free to pause this video and then come back when you're ready and then we will get started. Okay, are we ready? Great, let's get started. So you have probably learned in other classes about the slave trade and I'm just going to review very quickly what, what happened there. So slavery has been a source of labor for as long as one civilization has been attacking and dominating another. Slave trade in the new world, or what people from Europe called the Americas, has been happening since Europeans first sailed to uh, the, uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, for this class, we're mostly referencing the trade that happened between the African continent and the United States. Slavers continue to enslave people from Africa and forcibly transport them across the ocean to the Americas until 1807. After 1807, slavers could only buy and trade uh, enslaved people from within the United States. You can no longer import a person. And right now I'm going to take a moment and just comment on my terminology or the words that I'm using. You may notice that I'm not calling people slaves. People are not slaves. People are enslaved. So you will instead hear me say enslaved peoples. And I will admit that sometimes I get the words wrong and it's okay to get things wrong. Um, I grew up being told that these people were called slaves and it's a thing I work on every day to try and, and break that learning and change my terminology and unlearn it. And sometimes I get it wrong. And if I do, I apologize, I correct myself and I continue trying to get it right. So slavery continued in the United States through the Civil War and was the cause of the Civil War. As the Southern, South, uh, the Southern states, like uh, uh, Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina, they wanted to continue slavery. Uh, and, and this created many false reasons uh, for why they should be able to. And they tried to make them ethical and even necessary for why there should be an enslaved people. And most specifically, Black people. And I don't want to paint a picture that the Northern states were completely against slavery. In the North, there were people who agreed with segregation and there were people who didn't mind that that's how the Southern economy worked. But there were also people who did not agree that other people should be enslaved. And these were called abolitionists. And a lot of people who did not believe, and this is why they actually went to war up in the North, did not believe that the Southern states should be allowed to just leave or succeed from the Union. Excuse me while I flip my notes here, I have a lot of them. Um, the civil rights that we'll be talking about today is the fight for equality for black people and people of color. And while I sometimes use those phrases uh, interchangeably, all black people are people of color, not all people of color are black people. Uh, the American civil rights movement occurred because even though the United States government made slavery illegal, people of color still did not have rights and definitely did not have equal rights. And so now it's time for our timeline game. And I would like you to find a clear space. This might be on the floor, a curtain line strung on your wall, a string tape to the wall or any big counter space. I do want you to try and find a space where you can lay your timeline cards next to each other instead of on a stack because I want you to be able to compare when things happened in relation to each other. Uh, so when you're ready to start, pause the video and I will be waiting for you once you feel you have the events in the correct order. Welcome back. How do you feel about the order of your timeline? Uh, well, we aren't going to go over that just yet because I want us to get our cake started and in the oven so that we have a warm treat waiting for us when we reach the end of our class. So let's start making your cakes. Hopefully your oven is already preheated to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. If it is not, go ahead and do that now. Uh, and I'm going to bring over my, my box and my mixing bowl here. This is my prop box. Okay, so in our bowl, first we're going to add our butter. I use my fork right now. If you need to use a whisk, it's fine. I find that a fork works just as well and sometimes better. 
I have to add my egg. Just a nice messy egg, it's fun. And my sugar, I wanna make sure I use my sugar here. And my vanilla extract. So this is not completely all my, liquid, my liquids. I have not added my milk yet. But it's butter, egg, sugar, and vanilla. And what we're gonna do right now is called creaming it. So I'm just going to mix it together until it gets kind of to like a paste consistency. And this is why you want your butter to have been at room temperature or a little bit softer so that it whisks really well. If your butter is too cold, it's gonna get chunky. And you might wanna set it aside and let it warm up more or uh, put it in the microwave very slowly at very low heat, checking it often until it gets softened because you don't want it to be completely melted. That'll give you a very different consistency. Okay, so now I'm gonna add in my flour, slowly, a little bits at a time. my baking soda, my baking powder, excuse me, not baking soda, baking powder. They rise differently, so your cake will turn out different if you use the wrong ingredient. And my milk, and so you'll see right now it's still very dry. And I can keep stirring this and it will eventually combine better, but I do need to add my two tablespoons of milk. And I'm gonna stir this. So right now what we have is our vanilla cake batter and we're just gonna mix it until it's nicely combined. If you're having a problem or you need more time at any point in the video, feel free to pause it. And I will be waiting for you when you're ready to keep going. Okay, so this is actually where I am going to switch to my silicone spatula because I find that's easier for scraping the sides. And this is a little bit thicker than I want it to be. So I have some extra milk here. I'm just gonna add a little bit of it, like a teaspoon, because I want it to be able to pour just a little bit. All right, yeah, that looks better. So this is my vanilla cake batter, and I'm going to take about half of it and pour that into my greased cake pan. So here's my cake pan. I'm gonna pour about half of it. If you wanna do a little less than half, that's okay. If you end up doing a little more than half, also okay. Mistakes are a great way to learn. A little more than that. And I'm just going to set this aside. And now in my mixing bowl, I'm gonna add my two tablespoons of cocoa powder. And this is what's going to give us our chocolate cake. Now, sometimes when you add the powder again, it gets thicker again. And I find that you need to add, once again, just a little bit more milk. So let's get that nice and mixed. And so now you should have this nice chocolate cake mix. Isn't it silly that that's the only difference between a vanilla and a chocolate cake? Just a little bit of cocoa powder. Yes, different cakes require different ingredients, you know, different types of chocolate and things, but essentially the only difference is a little bit of chocolate. And that's what gives you a chocolate cake. Not even a whole lot, just a little bit. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back to my, my cake tin here that has my vanilla cake. And I'm just kinda gonna add it in a couple different spots. I'm not just gonna pull it on top because that's not how I want to do it. There is no wrong way to do this. So this is roughly the second half of our cake. I'm just gonna set that aside. I'm gonna go back to my fork. You can kind of see here, I just have pools of it on top. I'm just gonna start drawing, dragging my fork through. So I get a nice 
mixture and don't mix it entirely through. You want to be able to see the swirls of vanilla or the swirls of chocolate, depending on how much chocolate or how much vanilla you've used. But there we go. See, I have now my integrated marble cake mix. Okay, so let's go ahead and stick that in the oven. Once again, if you still need more time or if you need to walk away from your screen to go to the oven, remember you can always pause the video and I'll be waiting for you when you come back. So I'm gonna stick this in the oven. I'm gonna set a timer for about 16 minutes on my cake. These usually take around 16 to 20 minutes and you check this by inserting a toothpick in the middle and when it comes out clean, that is when your cake is done. Um, if your timer goes off while we're talking, make sure you pause the video to go check on your cake because I don't want your cakes to burn. So I'm going to set this up. And you need to go wash your hands or clean anything up, please go ahead. And when you come back, we're gonna be reviewing our timelines. Okay, so let's talk about our timelines. While I talk, if you want to correct your timeline or if you want to add a second timeline under the first order, whichever way you decide to see that, just make a note of which cards you've placed out of order and pay a little extra attention when those show up correctly. Uh, feel free to pause the video at any time if you feel like I'm not going too fast or you need extra time. So the first event on our timeline, my mouse turned off. Oh, that's our recipe. The first event on our timeline is going to be, I'm sorry, I'm having a technical issue here. It's going to be Leif Erikson. Um, so Leif Erikson was a Viking who created the first known European settlement. Uh, around the year 1000. He called this settlement Vinland, but today we would probably know that more as Newfoundland, Canada. And the next slide on our timeline, excuse me as I get my screens in a way that I can see everything. The next slide in our timeline is uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, we know that he made his initial journey to the Americas and the Caribbean in 1492. And of course, what Columbus was actually looking for was a, a shorter route to India for the spice trade, which is why he incorrectly called the indigenous people Indians, a misnomer which some people still use today. I prefer indigenous people or Native Americans. Uh, Columbus was not good to these people, enslaving many and causing mass genocide. Uh, so in September of 1565, the city of St. Augustine was founded, which is our next card on the timeline. St. Augustine was founded by Spanish colonials and is considered the oldest city in the United States. Our next card is the first assembly that meets in Jamestown. Uh, the first general assembly met in the choir, or choir. You can see that all the words are spelled differently on that slide. And when it was a newly built wooden church in Jamestown on June 30th, 1669, 1619. Uh, this was when enslaved people were first formally traded in to be sold in Virginia. Next, we have the arrival of the Mayflower in 1620, which a lot of elementary history classes teach you as when your ancestors came to the American colonies, but obviously that's not true for everybody or certainly most people. Um, I wanted to include these slides for context to see how much time occurred between when the Europeans first started interacting with the New World and our next timeline card. The Mayflower arrived in 1620 and enslaved people were being sold in the colonies, or were already being sold in the colonies. And our next, our next card is going to be in 1860 when South Carolina succeeded from the United States and the Civil War ends. This is 240 years of life in the Americas for, for the New World. Uh, in the summer of 1862, two years into the war, is when President Abraham Lincoln issued the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. If you look closely at the words on here, though, you'll see that even though he issued them in September of uh, 1862, it did not go into effect until January of 1863. And he said that no per any person held as a slave would be free. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing. You can read that. 
But it's not until the spring of 1865, a good two years later, that Lee surrenders at Appomattox and the Civil War is over. In May of 1865, after the Civil War has ended, that is when Tallahassee, the capital of Florida, issues its Emancipation Proclamation. So that's two and a half years later than when the official Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation was supposed to have taken effect. And then it is not until June 19th of 1865 that the last state, Texas, issues their Emancipation Proclamation. And that's why we currently are celebrating that day known as Juneteenth which is the last day that there were slave, uh, enslaved people in the United States. So how is your timeline doing? Remember, you can pause the video at any time if you need to shuffle things around or if I'm just talking too fast. So now the Civil War is over and all people are free and have equal rights, right? Sadly, no. Now we're in the period of time that we call Reconstruction. And that's when the Americans in the South are trying to rebuild their economy and can no longer re rely on unpaid laborers, so they're enslaved people. After Lincoln's assassination, Andrew Johnson, a Southern Democrat from Tennessee and former slave owner becomes, excuse me. That's embarrassing. So uh, Andrew Johnson, who's a former slave owner and a Southern Democrat from Tennessee becomes the next president. And Johnson was very lenient towards the former Confederates. He himself being a compatriot to them, he grew up around these people and represented them for a long time. And he had very lenient policies to help uh, the white so Southerners try to, to regain their status. Um, Lincoln's last speeches show that he was leaning towards supporting suffrage or voting rights for all freedmen, which may or may not have included women, depending on, on your research there. Uh, but Johnson and the Democratic Party are strongly opposed to this. And please note that the Republican Party and Democratic parties that I'm talking about in this time period are not like the part we have today. So Johnson's weak Reconstruction policies prevailed until the congressional elections of 1866. And those elections were followed by outbreaks of violence against blacks and the former rebel states, including the Memphis riots of 1866 and the New Orleans massacre of 1866, which sadly we don't have time to talk about in this class. But these were uh, attacks on black by white men against black union soldiers in Memphis and against mostly black Republicans outside the Louisiana Constitutional Convention in New Orleans. The 1866 election gave Republicans a majority in Congress, enabling to pass the 14th Amendment, federalizing equal rights for freedmen and dissolving rebel state legislatures until new constitutions were passed in the South. Sounds like that solves the problem, right? No. So Republicans set out to transform the society by setting up free labor economy using the U.S. Army and the Freedmen's Bureau. The Bureau protected the legal rights of freedmen and negotiated labor contracts and set up schools and churches for them. So thousands of Northerners came to the South and they were like as missionaries coming to the South for teachers, businessmen, politicians, and the hostile whites in the South began referring to these politicians as carpetbaggers. Um, the white Southerners did not like these federal policies. And so most local elected officials in the South enacted policies that discriminated against the black members of their society. During this time, the white supremacist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan or KKK were established and included many members of law enforcement and government officials. In 1877, Jim Crow laws were enacted. So here's your next timeline card. In practice, Jim, Lo Jim Crow laws mandated racial segregation in all public facilities. So courthouses, libraries, diners, et cetera. Jim Crow's laws were upheld in 1860, 1896 in Plessy versus Ferguson, in which the US Supreme Court laid out its policy of separate but equal. Uh, this was supposed to mean that whites and colored people would have their own establishments to serve the community, including schools, uh, but public education had essentially already been segregated for most of the South since the Civil War. Um, here in Northeast Florida in 1904, a very determined young black woman named Mary McLeod Bethune opened the Daytona Literary Industrial Training School for Negro Girls with a dollar fifty, Faith in God, and five little girls. 
$1.50 doesn't sound like much to us today. It wasn't much back then either, not even with inflation. Uh, Mary Bethune was an American educator, a stateswoman, a philanthropist, a humanitarian, uh, a womanist, and a civil rights activist. In 1923, Bethune College merged with the Cookman Institute of Jacksonville and became what we know of today as the Bethune Cookman University. And it is on the list of historical black colleges and universities. There's so much to talk about Mary Bethune that I could have an entire class just about her, but I don't have that time right now. So I encourage you to read about her on your own if you're look, interested in learning about a local she hero. She hero. Uh, in 1909, oh, sorry, here's another slide about Mary Bethune. In 1909, the NAACP or the National Association for the Advancement of Color People was founded. Um, this organization exists still today as a biracial endeavor to advance justice for African Americans. So in addition to public facilities being segregated, parks and beaches were also segregated. And there were very few places that colored people could go uh, and have a recreational visit. In here in Northeast Florida in 1935, American Beach was founded as a black community. It's just north of Amelia Island it still exists today on the National Register of Historic Places. And this made Jacksonville a destination location for many colored people who had the funds and ability to le travel for leisure. Segregations continued in all forms, but on May 17th, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education was decided by the Supreme Court and it should have ended racial education in schools or racial seg segregation in schools. Um, and then this next slide is just for historical context. In 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to change seats on the segregated bus system in Montgomery, Alabama, sparking the bus boycotts that lasted for over a year. And so we have in 1954, schools are no longer segregated, but in 1955, Rosa Parks is still being arrested for the segregated bus systems. So I want you to think about the disparity that's happening in, in society right now, how certain things are changing quickly and other things are just sliding backwards. So in 1959, this was after, after schools were desegregated. In 1959, the city of Jacksonville legally integrated their public schools. Legally does not mean they were integrated. It just means they did it as much as the law required them to. Um, in that same year, Jacksonville opened a new high school that they named Nathan Bedford Forest High School. Uh, Nathan Bedford Forest had no, let's go forward here, he had no connection to Northeast Florida. He's never been to Jacksonville. I don't know that he'd ever even been to Florida, but he was the Grand Wizard or head of the KKK, and only white students attended the school. In 18, I'm sorry, in 1966, the school was actually relocated. They, they moved its location to a larger school location and they maintained that name. So seven years later, they're keeping that same name. And there are several other schools, including Jefferson Davis Middle School and Robert E. Lee Senior High School that still exist here in Jacksonville that are named for members of the Confederacy. Um, skipping ahead a little bit, on December 6, 1960, a lawsuit was filed to desegregate Duval, Florida. This was called Braxton et al. versus the Board of Public Institution of Duval County, Florida et al. And their complaint, the Braxton plaintiffs alleged that Duval County maintained 113 totally segregated school, 89 white, 24 black, and that the schools themselves were also segregated, staffed by white teachers and principals, staffed by black teachers and principals. Remember, schools were legally required to be desegregated back in 1959. No, I'm sorry, 1954. Let me look at my, yes, 1954, that was Brown v. Board of Education. But in 1960, they were still mandated that. So, okay, now I'm judging back. This is in December of 1960 but I wanted to include it here for, for continuity. But if you're doing your timeline, notice there's going to be a little gap here. August of 1960, members of the Jacksonville Youth Council of the NAACP began having sit-ins at white only lunch counters in downtown Jacksonville, such as at Woolworths, and I believe Cohen's and a couple of other places. Lunch sit-ins were starting to happen all over the country as a peaceful way to protest. Um, so here we have, this is the, the photo that you're looking at here on the screen. Let me see if I can make it bigger. This is of the lunch sit-in that's happening at the Woolworths in downtown Jacksonville. 
about two to three weeks later on August 27th, 1960, is Axe Handle Saturday. This attack occurred in downtown Jacksonville and Hemming Park. It is called Axe Handle Saturday because the white assailants used axe handles and baseball bats that had been wrapped in barbed wire uh, first to attack the sit-in protesters and eventually any black person that they saw. So if you're following your timeline, remember that the sit-in protests and black handle, axe handle Saturday happen before Duval County desegregates. Um, I'm gonna take a moment if you need to pause this. I know this was this is a hard one to know. There's some accounts you can read in books such as it was never about a hot dog or a Coke and by um, Dr. Rodney Hurst Sr. and a couple other people who are you know, big council members here in Jacksonville that have more personal accounts of what happened on that day. It's, it's pretty dark and gruesome and it's, it's hard to think that that was such a thing that happened right here in Jacksonville. So several more years go by that include more protests, more sit-ins and more marches for black people looking for guarantees to their rights. On June 11th in 1964, so this is four years later, another protest occurred in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, this was the swim in at the Monsoon Motor Lodge. And what happened here is, is a group of black and white people agree to go swimming together. And that's what a swim in is. And what we're looking at in this picture is the white manager of the Monsoon Motor Lodge flooring chlorine into the pool in an attempt to give the swimmers chemical burns or scare them away from the pool. No one was hurt because it wasn't enough chlorine, but that was not because the manager wasn't trying. This pool is only a few miles north of Lincolnville, which is the historical black community that's in St. Augustine. And it is within the St. Augustine city, uh, city limits. And that is my cake done. If your cake timer is going off, feel free to pause the video and go check it. I'm just gonna leave mine in the oven though. So on July 2nd of 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law officially making discrimination based on race illegal. But it was not until 1965 that the Voters' Rights Act was signed, which is the, the Civil Rights Act that removes barriers to keep blacks from voting, such as literary tests, knowing the names of all of your state's judges, guessing how many jelly beans were in a jar or whatever other ridiculous question that the state registrar or the voter registrar could think of. In 1965, Jim Crow laws were officially repealed. Yeah, I'm skipping there. Okay, so in while Duval County was legally desegregated in 1959, a judge ordered Duval County schools to be desegregated, to integrate by 1970. So if you're looking at your timeline, you'll see that that card has two different dates. It's because I want you to look at the difference between when it was legally required versus when they actually were told to have it done by. So that's, that's 11 years in between there. And then it's another 34 years after that, that court federal order that Duval County schools actually wouldn't, uh, so 34 years after the federal courts ordered Duval County schools to desegregate, more than a third of the county's, pu the county's public schools were still student bodies of predominantly one race. So that was 34 years of it being legally required that they be integrated where they effectively were not. Uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest was renamed to Westside High School in 2014. And um, big change that happened literally right before recording this is um, that the city of Jacksonville just now, just recently voted in a seven to zero agreement to rename all of the schools that are based on, that are named based on Confederate soldiers. So Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, those schools here in Jacksonville will, excuse me, will finally be getting different names. Um, it's like, and only recently on June 6th of 2020, did Jacksonville remove the statue of the Confederate soldier located in Hemings Park? This is the same park that Axe Handle Saturday occurred in. So this is a good 40, you know, 60 years later, they're finally removing a statue of the Confederate soldier. That statue has been, had been there since 1898. Um, this 
happened occurring uh, following the protests or Black Lives Matters that occurred following the deaths of the death of George Floyd. And so now we're reaching the end of our class. And I know I went very fast for that. There was a lot of information. If you needed to pause or go back, please feel free. Um, but I want you to take a look at our timelines. I know it's been a long journey through our timeline and you can see that progress seems to happen sometimes slowly and sometimes a lot of change happens in a very short spurt. And we've discussed about 1,020 years of history. And so much of it has been just within the last 60 years. And there is still so much happening and so much work to be done for people of all color to have the same equality. Um, your cakes have either already come out of the oven or will soon. And I hope that the sweetness of their vanilla and chocolate cake working together can help ease some of the, the dark, bitter aftertaste of this topic. If you're not from Northeast Florida, I hope that this class inspires you to look at the civil rights history of your city. And if you are from Jacksonville, I hope that you continue to learn even more as I barely scratched the surface in this class. If you have more questions and would like some additional resources or want to send us feedback or pictures, because I love pictures, please send me pictures. You can email me at dara, D-A-R-A, at makinghistory.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Until next time, bye.